going on everybody? My name is James Prince. I'm a sophomore student athlete studying in the College of Agriculture here at the University of Delaware. Today, I would like to present my person who I believe in African American history has much importance yet does not receive the attention or recognition that they deserve. Before I get into the story, I would like to say a very special thank you to my grandfather, John Ahern. Without him telling me about this in a newspaper clipping over two years ago, I would have never learned about this story and been able to share it with such an audience like this. I would also like to say thank you to the author of this book, Stephen L. Jones, titled Football's Fallen Hero, The Jack Trice Story. Without him, I would have much of my research into this would have not been very successful. And I'm very appreciative that he, someone like him wrote this book over 20 years ago. I definitely recommend purchasing this book if you want to learn more about Jack Trice and his life. Without further ado, here is the story of Jack Trice. The moment John G. Trice, known as Jack by his family, was born on May 12, 1902 in Hiram, Ohio, he was destined for greatness. Living about 40 miles southeast of Cleveland, he was a grandson of slaves and his father, Green Trice, served in the all-black 10th Cavalry Regiment of the United States Army, known as the Buffalo Sur Soldiers, during the westward expansion after the Civil War. After excelling in his academics and sports in high school, Trice followed five of his teammates, as well as his former high school coach, Sam Williamson, to Iowa State College in Ames, Iowa. Jack Trice made history even before he played it down of football. He was Iowa State's college's first African-American athlete, which at the time was called Iowa State College of Agricultural and Mechanic Arts. His arrival was much made much more significant by the fact that this was the early 1920s, and many schools, especially in the South and Midwest, did not integrate teams until the 1950s and 60s. With this, the reaction of Trice's involvement on Iowa State's team received plenty of backlash. The states of Missouri... Kansas and Oklahoma all refused to let their schools play against an African American. Essentially, what they said was that either Trice would not play in the game against them or there would be no football games. This was very important as Iowa State's schedule that year included Kansas State University, the University of Missouri, Washington University in St. Louis, and the University of Nebraska, all hailing from states that imposed their Jim Crow style laws. As expected at that time, Trice faced prejudice and discrimination, and yet he kept going. Despite all of this, Jack was accepted by his teammates and was looking to have a blossoming relationship and future with Iowa State. As Once he was a sophomore, after beating a smaller school called Simpson College from Indianola, Iowa, 14-6, Iowa State's real test would be against the University of Minnesota. The team traveled by train over 215 miles and arrived at a hotel in Minneapolis. The Curtis Hotel stated that Trice got to stay at the same hotel as his teammates, but he was not allowed to eat with them in the dining room. During the night, Jack's legacy and story would be written into history. As a college football player myself, the nerves that you have before a big game is something indescribable. You practice all, all week in preparation for the game, and the whole night all you can think about is the game itself running different situations in your head, how certain plays might happen, what to do in specific situations, and the thought of conquering your opponents builds this type of excitement and nervousness inside of you. Jack, presumably having the same feeling that myself and thousands of others have had, writes a letter to himself. It stated, My, fr my thoughts just before the first real college game of my life. The honor of my race, family, and self is at stake. Everyone is expecting me to do big things. I will. My whole body and soul are to be thrown recklessly about the field tomorrow. Every time the ball is snapped, I will be trying to do more than my part. On defensive plays, I must break through the opponent's line and stop the play in their territory. Beware of mass interference. Fight low with your eyes open and towards the play. Watch out for cross bucks and reverse end runs. Be on your toes every minute if you expect to make good. Jack. Prepare to today's sport. Football was gory and violent in those days with no face masks and limited restrictions on violent maneuvers. Not only was the equipment inadequate to the challenges of warding off blows, but defensive players used their hands and forms to weapons to the head, neck, and face, a practice not specifically outlawed until the 30s. The game had actually turned up so much carnage, 18 deaths and 159 serious injuries nationwide in 1905, that President Theodore Roosevelt, himself who played college football, insisted that football be made safer or abolished. The college heads responded with the forward pass, which spread out the field of play, and modified the rules again after another 10 college football players were killed in 1909. 
yet the game retained much of its raw brutality in the 1920s. As Minnesota receives the ball in the first half, tries to start on defense, a defensive line. On the second play of the game, Trice injures his left shoulder, which actually would be found out that he actually broke his collarbone on a blocking play. The existing substitution rules stipulate that if he comes out, he would not be able to return to the game until the second half, so he shrugs off his teammates' concerns and resumes his position at right defensive tackle. After a tough first half that ended in the score 7-7, to Iowa State has its ball on the 20-yard line. The Gophers of Minnesota intercept a deflected pass and run it into the end zone. Cyclone fans back in State Gym, which is the home of Iowa State, groan. Minnesota 14, Iowa State 7. The Gophers kick off and the Cyclones start driving. That's when it happens. On a play when Minnesota player Norton Beam catches a pass. Trice goes down. He dived into the legs of Minnesota's blockers trying to stop the ball carrier. The move which was a roll block referred to in his letter, was later banned from college and professional football from being too dangerous. Instead of laying on his stomach on all fours, he ends up laying up on his back and was stampeded by a rush of cleats. Being just tackled after a 10-yard gain, he pops up and returns to his position, along with all the other players. All but one. According to some of his teammates, including teammate Johnny Bean, quote, the fullback going through the hole stepped on Jack's stomach and maybe his groin, Mr. Bean told the Cleveland Plain Dealer in 1979 interview. He was ba- badly hurt, but tried to get up and wanted to stay in. We saw he couldn't stand and had to help him off the field. The story is most often told this way, but just because it's the most frequently repeated version does not validate its accuracy. Regardless of how the play actually happened, the result was the same, and questions lingered. Did the Minnesota players target Trice because he was the only black player on the field, intending to injure him, possibly even mortally? Or did they target him simply because he was a good player who threatened their chance of victory, perhaps wanting to knock him out of the game? Or was the injury simply just an accident, one that might even resulted in Trice's reckless play? The result is the same. As his insides were crushed, Trice struggles in his, to a sitting position. His teammates help him to his feet. He wants to stay in the game. If he comes out now, the rules do not allow him to return. He does not believe he has finished what he promised. To do more than my part, he said. He does not want to let the hate, if it was hate, to defeat him. But it is impossible. He can barely rise and stand and can only walk off the field supported between two teammates as the Minnesota fans chant, We're sorry, Ames. We're sorry. The Iowa State trainers insisted that they take Trice to the University of Minnesota Medical Center. The physicians there did not fully grasp the seriousness of Trice's condition. It's uncertain that they even diagnosed his broken collarbone. They had inevitably treated other black patients, but this time, perhaps was persuaded by Trice downplaying the severity so he could return to Ames with his teammates, they did not provide adequate care. They released Trice only a few hours after he had been admitted in the hospital. Back in Ames, his wife, Cora May, learned of the injury and probably experienced a brief panic familiar to anyone who has watched a loved one get hurt in the game of football, or in any sport. She bowed her head and prayed that he would be okay. The fact he walked up the field, she said later in an interview, revealed her of some worry. Trice rode the train back into Ames in pain, settled on a straw madness, and endured the final 12 miles to Campbell's on a jolting bus ride, probably gritting his teeth and moaning, each bump making his insides feel like they were being trampled all over again. Iowa State's football team returned to campus. He was later admitted into Iowa State's campus hospital. On Sunday... After the game, he seemed to be doing somewhat better. Cora May visited him, but said that Jack could not speak to her. Two days later, he would die from those injuries he suffered fighting not only for his brothers on the field, but those black athletes who would play before and after him. The school suspended classings the following afternoon for his memorial. His teammates carried him in a simple gray casket to the field fronting the Campanile, the campus landmark, and draped his casket in a blanket in the school colors cardinal and gold three maybe four thousand students faculty and football fans from the town spread across the lawn 
Jack's mother, Anna, was there. She had arrived at 6.45 p.m. the previous day, too late to say goodbye. Although there was a great mourning period for Jack, he would soon be lost to history and to the minds of the people in Ames, Iowa. However, in 1973, during a period of social and economic change throughout the country, when a plaque dedicated to Jack in the state gym, now obscured by bird droppings and dust, caught the eye of an athletic department tutor who had told an English student suggested the new Iowa State football stadium under construction should be named after Trice, and thus a cause was born. Though there was plenty of resistance from those in the establishment of Iowa State, the largely white establishment of Iowa State, the protest and awareness was created by the college students of Iowa State, especially those in the Black Student Union there. When ISU was building a new stadium on campus, students demanded that the stadium be dedicated to Jack in his honor. The stadium, built in 1979 to replace the Clyde Williams Field, was finally named after Jack Trice in 1977 after a long promotion to name it after him that started in 1973. It was originally named Cyclone Stadium in 1984, and the playing field after that was named Jack Trice Field as well. But after much public support, they officially named the entire stadium after Jack Trice. Today, a bronze statue of Trice, erected in 1987, stands near the stadium. And Jack Trice is the only FBS stadium named after an Afri African American. Now the stadium and the bronze statue stand as a commemoration of a young man who sacrificed it all for his team, his race, his family, and himself. Jack Trice is not only an inspiration for all college athletes, but someone, in my opinion, whose name should be spoken in the same breath as players like Jackie Robinson, Jesse Owens, Jim Brown, and Jack Johnson. Men who paved the way for others to have the opportunity to follow their dreams and passions. Although the man only played two varsity games, his career and legacy should be something of the pinnacle of college football's vast lore and history. He inspires myself today to be a part of something bigger than myself and that the game that I play would not be possible without men like Jack Trice.